This call is now being recorded. Okay, brilliant. So, hi guys, welcome to the podcast. Um, this is the second episode now, and we have Kotatsu from Machinkura in South Africa, who is building absolutely incredible infrastructure around Bitcoin and the Lightning Network. Um, yeah, it's it's just just super exciting the whole thing what he's doing, um, and it's really allowing people to access Bitcoin without even any internet infrastructure, which is uh, for this early on in Bitcoin's life cycle is pretty incredible in my opinion. So look, just to start, um, Kutatsu, if like if you, if you want to share your background, like growing up and your kind of whole Bitcoin journey, how you ended up kind of taking the orange pill, all that kind of good stuff. Cool. Oh yeah. So yeah, my name is Rotato Ngaku, and I'm from Pretoria, South Africa. And yeah, I grew up in Mamelodi. Um, was part of the um, hip hop scene, um, rap scene. So yeah, you as a young kid, I made beats uh, with a um, computer, a home computer, and. As I was transitioning from high school to university, I was trying to make a decision. Like, what do I do now? You know, do I continue down this hip-hop rap path or explore something else, you know? And, yeah, so I made the decision to explore computer science. And um, that's what I studied at university, at the University of Victoria. And it was fun times. Um, learned a lot of stuff. Um, transitioned into becoming a software developer and during my time due at the university that's where I kind of discovered Bitcoin you know, um, we were actually um, presented uh, on Bitcoin um, one of our lecturers or computer security lecturers uh, did a presentation on Bitcoin and that's the first time I heard about it. And uh, even at the time, we had an exchange in the country. I think it was called BitX, and it was later changed to Luno. Um, yeah, I think we also learned about uh, the exchange in that class. But I totally ignored all of that. And it was early days. I think I could have gotten a Bitcoin for like a thousand rands. It should be like a hundred dollars or something like that. But, you know, um, I was like, eh, I'm here to learn uh, computer stuff and not uh, do investments and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, 2016 or t um, came about or late 2015. And I was doing some hacky stuff on the internet and I got a bounty reward and it was a thousand US dollars a reward. And I have the option of receiving the payment in Bitcoin or via PayPal. Right? So um, now that was the first time I was actually presented with the opportunity of receiving Bitcoin. Right? So at that point, it, I would have gotten like 1.3 Bitcoin for a thousand US dollars. And I was like, what am I going to do with this Bitcoin after I get it? You know, um, In my analysis, I literally had nothing I could do with it. All it was going to do was sit. You know? And yeah, um, I don't think we had um, anything. Um, you know, letting money sit was not in, in our syllabus. If you receive money, you had to do something with it. So um, then I contrasted that with PayPal, where, which I could use on basically every online store, uh, which I could buy music uh, using, you know, and I'm a huge music fan. So I took the thousand US dollars in PayPal and then I spent it and I bought a new laptop as well. Um, and yeah, today my laptop that is worth 1.3 Bitcoin doesn't work anymore. Um, it started by having a faulty hard drive and um, a faulty screen. And yeah, I would patch it up, you know. Um, and then just one day it stopped working. And I was like, ah, oh, cool. Uh, I'm not going to fight this fight anymore. I've already lost. So, um, yeah, um, then when I became conscious on Bitcoin, um, like in, intentional, on was 2017 with the bull market. 
And then I was like, wait, why is this uh, a lot more valuable than it was when I was presented with the opportunity of getting 1.3 Bitcoin? And yeah, then the greed kicked in and I was like, maybe I missed something and maybe I should, you know, uh, see what I missed. And then I, was, I went on my search for the next Bitcoin and uh, started shitcoining, buying all of these different um tokens uh just trying to you know catch it catch them while they were still young as well and yeah uh lucky for me that didn't last too long you know because the 2018 bear market was right around the corner so um, yeah um all of the coins i bought we went down the train right? and yeah, um, lucky for me, Binance present. Um, well, what's the what did they do? Oh, they implemented a feature called a dust, um, selling your dust. You know, because most of them became so worthless, I couldn't trade them on the Binance engine because they were below the actual um minimum amount that is tradable on their engine, and so I could trade the dust for BNB. And then hopefully the accumulated BNB became um, enough for me to trade that for Bitcoin. And yeah, that, that was the case. But even with that, there was still some I couldn't trade because, it, you know, they stopped operating and stuff like that. And that was my lesson and um, tuition fee in um, shitcoining, you know. And then I was like, okay, cool. Maybe there's something I'm not really understanding in the Bitcoin side. And from there, I went down the rabbit hole, read the Bitcoin standard, read as much literature on the topic as I could, not just Bitcoin, but also investments. Um, some other guy I read um, had an article saying you should make the 30 year investment. And then so he was looking at stocks though in his article so i applied the similar methodology but on bitcoin like if you're planning to hold bitcoin for 30 years what do you expect to see 30 years later you know um and one of the main elements with the 30 year investment of course is you're looking for business um or to invest in something that will last long enough for you to actually you know um, execute the trade successfully. So 80 years is a long time. Most companies don't last that long. So picking a company that will last 80 years, you have to know what you're getting into. Um, and yeah, also looking at the long-term trend. Right. So the conclusion for most people make looking to make a 30 year investment is that you should, you know, buy index funds. Because whether or not a company survive the index fund will be there 30 years from now. So you just accumulate index funds. So um, on the other hand, we get Bitcoin, which most likely will exist 30 years from now, regardless of the price, because of the difficulty adjustment, right? So yeah, uh, then I was like, okay, cool. Then this seems like one of the few things you could yeah, make a 30 year bet on. And then mm, I went, um, all in and 2018 2019 after reading quite a lot of literature i was like damn i wish the people in my neighborhood could you know go down the same rabbit hole and i started um organization non-profit organization that translates uh, literature that explains how bitcoin works into native african languages because all the great literature is in english you know and most people around the world don't speak English, whether it's as a second language, third language, fourth language, they, you know, speak other languages. So in Africa specifically, yeah, um, I think French might be one of the biggest uh, spoken languages, uh, but we have a lot of languages across the African continent. And yeah, so um, axonomia.africa is um, the project and we aim to translate as much content, as much literature into African languages as possible. And yeah, the whole aim of that is to get rid of the language barrier. You know, uh, if a person wants to learn about Bitcoin, they should be able to get all that content in an easily accessible fashion.
And continuing on that same train of thought of getting rid of the barriers to that people will face if they want to adopt Bitcoin or if they want to use Bitcoin, um, then started uh, this project, which is the reason why we're having this call, which is Machangura. You know, um, internet is one of the barriers we are facing in Africa. You know, uh, only thirty percent of the population has um, access to the internet, so. Um, how would a person use Bitcoin if it's, um, what do they call it? The internet's native currency or something like that? Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, Bitcoin is a digital currency. Yeah. And in Africa, you know, digital payments have been a thing since 2008. Uh, you, uh, before this call, you were talking about Mbisa. You know, Mbisa, I think, started around 2008, 2007. And yeah, um, the majority of all financial transactions across the African continent are executed via mobile money. Right? Uh, so they are digital payments. And um, of all the digital payments uh, done on the African continent, 90%, if not 94%, are mobile money payments. Right? So um, yeah, uh, then I was like, okay, cool. Basically, we could use that medium, the GSM medium, to send and receive Bitcoin. And that is what Machangura effectively is. Um, and um, the USSD interface is a great interface. It's a prompt and response interface. So a person can, you know, not know what it is they're getting into, just dial a code and then get a prompt. And from the prompt, they will know and understand what it is that they need to do. And yeah, um, then we're here. Brilliant. God, that was an incredible <laughs> introduction. I had other questions, kind of spin-off questions wrote down to go through, and you were just answering them all <laughs> before before I could ask them. Um, my bad, my bad. No, no. <laughs> Great job. Um, mm -hmm. So, God, yeah, M-Pesa. So just to start on that, um, just, just for someone who's totally not unaware, because to my understanding is like, M pays a mobile money USSD. It's either not available or not used in the West or really outside of Africa. Um, could mm. could you explain? Uh, first of all, is that correct? Is it only is it is it the fact that it's kind of obsolete in countries with high internet access and it's not used, or is it only kind of the infrastructure built for it in Africa? Mm. Yeah, technically it can work in any country, but um, if you have high enough internet access, you would just use um, an app or a website, right? Online yeah. banking. Uh, yeah, so, so it's like there's no um, service providers because there's no market need. Is that correct? Yeah, right. Um, it's more convenient to just have an app if you have uh, high enough usage, right? So even in PESA, uh, I think you could use it with an app in Kenya. Okay, okay, that's interesting. Due to the demographics of internet access, use it via the USSD interface. Yeah, I totally understand. So like for m point of view, so how mobile money works generally, could you explain that? And then we'll just pivot into how Matching Core works using that, just for people that don't understand. Okay, yeah, so m is basically, you know, um, I think it's easier if I talk about Machangura because I also don't know how Mbisa works since I'm not in Kenya. You know? Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, well, yeah, we all know how Bitcoin works. You install a wallet, you install an app on your phone, and that app uh, manages your Bitcoin balance. Um, it allows you to send and receive Bitcoin either on chain or via Lightning, right? So, yeah, that is then what I do. Um, on behalf of the users because um, the USSD interface is just a prompt and response interface, you know. Um, so I cannot do any computations or program it to do anything. Um, so it cannot uh, hold a private key. It cannot sign a Bitcoin transaction. It cannot query a peer for the state of the blockchain. So um, I effectively run a custodial Bitcoin service uh, on behalf of the user. And then each user has a Bitcoin balance on the service. And every time Bitcoin is sent and received to their account, which is usually associated with their phone number or their username, 
their balance gets updated and yeah so um, at the end of the day somebody sends a person who's using my changura bitcoin and then i update the balance and send that person an sms and say yo you've just received bitcoin for this much and then they can dial the ussd code i'm trying to make the code a triple three star a triple three hash in every country if i succeed um and after they dial the code they get um you know, uh, uh, a prompt on what they want to do, check balance, send Bitcoin, receive Bitcoin, all that good stuff. And yeah, then if they check balance, they will see that, oh, they have actually received a certain amount of Bitcoin. And okay. Basically- yeah, and, and so, so this is totally operable from like, you know, your kind of, not obviously also smartphone, but you know, more a dumb phone, like, so just no touch screen, nothing like that. Mm-hmm. Any phone uh, for that matter. Yeah, so so what's going on? So these phones don't have any... So, so like, how is... So the, I know this is all done over Lightning Wallets at the moment. So how is mm-hmm. Match and Core then... So just for my understanding, so how is it telling Lightning to operate? So it's once someone has a cell signal um, and not mm-hmm. necessarily an internet connection, they're telling your Lightning Wallet how to operate via USSD. Is, is that correct or not? Not at all. Right? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. Basically, what happens is that um, a person... Oh, do you know how Wallet of Satoshi works? Yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, so um, Machangura works exactly like Wallet of Satoshi, right? Um, except it's not on... Um, and it's not... It, I, well... I don't have an app or a website for now, right? So, um, a wallet of Satoshi, you can receive and send Bitcoin whether or not you have the app on your phone, right? Whether or not you've opened the, um, their website because they're a custodial um, service and they run a Lightning node on behalf of their users, right? So, mm-hmm. I also run a Lightning node on behalf of all the Machangura users. And yeah, I manage channels and do all of that good jazz. Um, and from there, what what do I do after that? Um, yeah, um, I just manage users' account balance, right? So when a user issues an invoice uh, via a Lightning address, by the way, I just track that this Lightning invoice is associated with this user. So when that lightning invoice gets paid, I know, oh, this was the user that um, is associated with that lightning invoice. Okay, and just how is, so I suppose the, the question, what I'm trying to wrap my head around is, how is the USSD protocol communicating this back to you? Is it, It's literally just telling you, uh, it, like it's creating the invoice and then your um, custodial wallet, it, yeah? Oh, yeah. No. So the service does all the Bitcoin stuff without even touching the USSD interface. Right. So um, the thing with the USSD interface is that it has 160 character limit. Okay. So uh, if you've seen a lightning invoice, it's usually longer than 160 characters. Right? Mm-hmm. So um, what I do is... Um, basically leverage lightning addresses to the fullest, right? So um, let me start off with this. Uh, the average Mashangura user will probably send to another person's phone number. Right? Yeah. And yeah. So I don't need to make a lightning transaction in that instance need to make a um, lightning transaction in right. that instance. Right? I uh, just update the database that, oh, this person sent uh, these, these many sets to this other phone number. Right? And then when a person is uh, paying a lightning address, the service creates or initiates all the things that it needs to do to get a lightning invoice from the lightning address that a person entered. Okay. Right. And the user never sees a lightning invoice because it 
a lightning invoice would not fit on the um, yeah 160 character limit yeah yeah but they they don't need and, to see it. it it just works yeah <laughs> yeah right and then from there on i pay the lightning invoice and then I also host uh, Lightning addresses on behalf of the users. So each user gets phone number at 8333.mobi. So when you are paying a Machangura user, you just pay to uh, that phone number at 8333.mobi, and then, yeah, it, it works. It's a Bitcoin transaction. And then they get um, a notification that they just got uh, set, right? My... Um, lightning address is hotato at a triple thread dot mobi so you can pay uh to that and my phone will not even notice or will not even you know uh, have to issue a lightning invoice because that lightning invoice is issued by the service in the back end right so the service is online but the user doesn't necessarily have to be online yeah yeah i understand god that's incredible um and, and was this hard to like how did you figure all this out was this um or is this just you or are you working in a team or yeah oh yeah well i'm working alone uh but i have a team um um yeah we just trying to push uh bitcoin adoption but on the technical side i'm working alone and on figuring this out, um, well, uh, as you've said, uh, well, you didn't say this on this podcast. Uh, well, this has been around for a while. I've dabbled in Vesa as well, uh, early days as a software developer. And um, no, well, not Vesa per se, but mobile money. And yeah, um, once you understand how USSD works, you can basically set this up um, for anything. Right. And yeah, uh, so earlier this year, I also set up a node uh, on a Pi. Right. So, um, oh, I have, probably have a Pi in my bag, but you know, um, you don't need to take that out. So, um, yeah. Um, and yeah, with that Pi, I was like, what is it that I'm going to do with this node now that I have it up? And I also set up a lightning node. Um, and then I was like, okay, cool. Let me see if I could set something up. Uh, and that people could use, and then Machankura was born, right? So I just paired um, the node with uh, the USSD interface and glued them together, right? And, yeah, so there was a few things I wanted to look at that I didn't know at the time, you know? So the first one, for me, was the 160-character limit, right? Um, I wouldn't have done this project if lightning addresses were not a thing, right? So the thing with the lightning address is human readable, human writable. I can easily say my lightning address is Khotato at mobi, and then I don't need to memorize a 64 character string like a Bitcoin address, you know? <laughs> and the other thing is if you have a feature phone, how are you going to input? a 64 character uh, string without making a mistake, you know. Um, with T9 typing, if you are doing T9 typing, and all of that jazz. So the other thing was um, the 20 second session timeout thing, you know. So, yeah. Um, we added a few features so that a person could input a lightning address um, even with the 20 second timeout. So what we do is split up the input. So you enter the username first and then the domain after in case you're using a feature phone that doesn't allow you to tap an email address quick uh, or in 20 seconds. Right? And yeah, um, another feature we added is basically if your session times out, you can restart it where you left off. So, um, yeah, th things like those we just discovered along the way, like, oh, cool. Um, inputting a lightning address is very tiresome for a person who's using a feature phone, right? So split that up. Oh, session times out means that you have to start all over again. Oh, allow a person to continue the previous session, you know. And uh, as we go, we add features that make using it much more easier you know and yeah i think the beauty of bitcoin as well is that 
this code base is the same in every other country. You know, I don't have to uh, write it again for um, Namibia or write something different for South Africa or Kenya or Nigeria. I'm using the same code base across all these countries. Yeah, yeah. And it's because that USSD is a, like the framework. It's just a protocol that you're just copying, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. God, that, that's really good. So, like... um. So where is this available? And like, I suppose, what is involved in, because the code base is the same in each country, um, like you said, I'd imagine from a technical point of view, it must be very simple to start in each new con- uh, country. So like, where is this in- available? What's involved in setting up in a new country? Is there legal concerns, um, licensing, anything like that? Yeah, Um. so... um. Basically, I use a USSD gateway provider. You know, technically, without a USSD gateway provider, I'd have to talk with the telecoms in each country to get them to um, give me a code that I can then uh, run the service on. I uh, actually have an article which I should publish um, called uh, The Medium is Not the Message. Right? So... Um, Technically speaking, um, GSM is the same as HTTP. Oh, well, HTTP is, um, well, it works on GSM as well, but either way, uh, GSM is the same as 3G, 4G, 5G. It's just slower, you know, uh, it's better for text based uh, messages. Right? So, um, with that, for me, um, I don't see why it should be an issue for a person to access a Bitcoin wallet in Tanzania, in Nigeria, in Kenya, download that same Bitcoin wallet from the Play Store, or uh, access the, mm, that app on their, uh, bit, um, on their website, right? But be unable to access it via USSD, right? Um, because as um, the telecom as a service provider should be able to give its users access to the things that they want to access, you know, like from a net neutrality standpoint. But that being said, we're in Africa and net neutrality is not that big of a thing here, right? So um, in each country, basically, I have to talk with the telecoms, educate them, and uh, hopefully uh, they're okay with it. Um, But in most cases, um, the other aspect of it is the central banks have totally said they are against Bitcoin companies in Nigeria and in Kenya. You know, the central banks uh, have debanked uh, Bitcoin companies or exchanges for that matter. But the biggest condition on their ban has been that... um, Financial institutions should close the um, accounts of Bitcoin companies and Bitcoin exchanges, right? And for me, uh, with this project, the project is a Bitcoin-only project, so I don't need uh, uh, an account in any of these countries, right? Um, And yeah, most of the time with, with the central banks as well, as long as I'm not doing any trading from Bitcoin, to the national currency or any other currency or cryptocurrency for that matter, I'm okay. Right? It's a Bitcoin only project and it um, works in any country. So even in Nigeria, where uh, most of these exchanges cannot have a national bank account, they can still operate with uh, Bitcoin. You know, they can allow people to send and receive Bitcoin in those countries. So um, yeah. Um, the legal side, uh, the regulation side, has effectively led the project to be Bitcoin only. Even though the project was already Bitcoin only, I think it just strengthened the stance that this would be a Bitcoin only project without any trading from fiat or any other cryptocurrency. Yeah, exactly. So like this is just p- it's pure circular economy kind of stuff. Um, so it's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah. Yeah, God, that's, that's that's super interesting. And it's in about nine African countries at the moment, is that correct? Available in nine countries, and I'm working on the next deployment. But um, you can see the countries, it's live and on the website, atripletrade.mobi. Uh, just to name a few, it's Nigeria, Malawi, Kenya, Ghana, Uganda, and Namibia, and South Africa as well, because I'm here. And yeah. 
Cool. And okay, so you said technically the start is mainly in Africa, but I suppose this could be rolled out to like any country that um has you know cell phone access, <laughs> which is all of them. Yeah. But like say like a country like India or something. Yeah. Right. So um, I was looking at uh, countries with such a demographic where you could actually get usage uh, from people without um, high internet access right? So um, who would like to use Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so as long as there's like a USSD gateway, you can just plug into that and just get going. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Even if there's no USSD gateway, just um, receptive telecoms, right? Um, the reason why I use a USSD gateway provider is because most of the time, um, telecoms are not receptive to a person who doesn't wear a suit like myself. You know? um, so I, you know, I would mm -hmm. not do well in the meetings. <laughs> yeah i get you um so adoption then so like how is this and just i suppose questions around this you have people um transacting through the through manchakura every day um uh, to pay for things through lightning and all that is the so i suppose what what are the adoption numbers what does it look like and as a separate question after like how does bitcoin volatility is this a concern for like people with um with payments or is it just much better than anything that's already there okay yeah so adoption is a little slow but it's a mix you know some days is very quick like it seems viral some days and then some days it slows down um but i think for me I'm still trying to solve a few problems, uh, specifically in a lot of these countries, like how do they get Bitcoin? You know, like where would they buy their Bitcoin? So um, I think South Africa is an outlier because uh, as Deco vouchers are quite uh, easily accessible. They have an integration with this voucher called One For You. And I could buy that voucher and load it up on my Changura. You know? And the nature of the vouchers being printable is that um, you can effectively sell and buy them from anywhere in the country, right? even in the most rural villages. Right? And this fits the profile quite well because a person who does not have internet access, how is this person going to get um, on an exchange um, to buy Bitcoin? Right? Most likely... That's a challenge in itself. So the stack of vouchers give them uh, a very good way of uh, getting Bitcoin. Right? Um, so I'm trying to see how uh, to make that more accessible in all the other countries as well. And um, what's the other thing? Um, what was the other part of the question? Just, just around the people using it to pay for goods and oh, services no is vo volatility oh, yeah, an issue for the volatility oh yeah so volatility like i think this year has been the most stable year for bitcoin um well as you're saying um it's probably been more stable than most currencies um just uh chilling at the 19,000 us dollar ranges um 18,000 us dollar ranges and Oh man, um, I also believe that volatility is really not an issue if we look at how most people use money. You know, um, I might be wrong, but a majority of the people spend money before they get it, right? So, um, um, most people get paid today, and in three days, they've already spent the majority of the salary on rent, groceries. Um, all of these different things, right? So what I'm trying to do is uh, allow a person to spend their Bitcoin in a similar fashion, you know? Like if you're paying rent, if you're paying um, for groceries, if you're paying for fuel, whatever, um, you should be able to do that on Machangu, right? And for a person living and doing this, chances are they wouldn't, be affected by volatility well as long as um they 
within the days that they got their salary and they spent their salary, Bitcoin doesn't dip, right? But um, the other thing is prehistorically from what I saw is due to the fact that most people also buy Bitcoin on month end or during the days that most people get their salaries, the Bitcoin price goes up as a result. Right. So um, a person is most likely to end up with more purchasing power due to the fact that on the day that they got paid in Bitcoin, other people um, bought Bitcoin. Right. Or, well, if they bought Bitcoin as well, uh, they pushed the Bitcoin price up and then they got to spend that Bitcoin before it, it crashed. Right. So, yeah, for me, volatility is not too much of an issue, but factoring in that most countries' currencies are also experiencing record high inflation. You know, uh, Ghana inflation is like at like 20% this year. I uh, think Nigeria, well, I really don't know the numbers in Nigeria because they have an official rate and a black market rate. And yeah, you know, uh, I don't want to join uh, that discussion. And South Africa, like, I do not believe whatever the government says the inflation level is because when I go to the store, I bought a pen for 10 rand. Uh, well, I can't, I don't, I, I don't know how much 10 rand is, but I, oh yeah, it's almost a dollar actually. Yeah, I bought a pen for almost a dollar and I was shocked. I was like, wait, why am I paying almost a dollar for a pen? You know, this used to be uh, less than 50 cents. This used to be like 25 cents. Um, and yeah, then I'm like, okay, cool. Inflation is really bad. Uh, I even went home to actually Google the pen prices just because I thought uh, the corner store was ripping me off, right? And yeah, <laughs> it was literally um, that 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 was the price. And yeah, so then what does volatility, Bitcoin volatility, look like in that aspect, right? And even on the other markets, I think I saw something that was saying either the U.S. Treasuries or the S&P 500 was, for this year, was more volatile than Bitcoin. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So for me, I'm like, hey, Ben, volatility is not that bad, if we're being honest, right? Um, and the other aspect of it is, well, a much more deeper conversation, like, what value does a stable currency give you? Right? Um, what type of prosperity does a stable currency give you? And that is a statement I'm making specifically referring to all the countries um, that use the CFA, right? Um, uh, the colonial franc. Uh, what do they call it? Uh, yeah, I think that's this. Uh, yeah. Yeah, right. So they have had a stable currency for years that is kind of pegged to um, the uh, French banking system. Yeah, I think that is the correct word to use because all the transactions that they're making have to be routed uh, to the French, uh, French central bank. And I think the uh, French central bank gets a cut or something like that, so on and so forth. But yeah, all of these countries have had a pretty stable currency, but what is the prosperity that they have to show for it, right? Um, and yeah, so, you know, you either have economic liberty or whatever is happening um, with the CFA. Right. And that is delivered to you with a stable currency. Right? Uh, the U.S. dollar is another example because they export inflation. Right? Um, I do not think there's any country that has increased their monetary supply as much as the United States. But everyone knows that the USD will probably be the last to fall. You know, uh, the UK is on shaky ground, the UK economy and actually UK as a concept is on shaky ground because um, the economy is literally unstable. Uh, they had to step in and save pension funds. Right? And I don't think the, the UK did as much money printing as the United States, but just because US exports inflation you know, um, the UK has 
to fall by the wayside. And yeah, we saw Sri Lanka uh, fall for in, in a similar fate as the UK. We, sh- we saw Lebanon fall a similar fate. Uh, Turkey is fall a similar fate. Argentina continuously falling a, a similar fate. So for me, I'm like, okay, cool. What is it with having a stable um, currency that is, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Desirable. Mm-hmm. When 90% of the time, all the stable currencies are um, stable because they have USD in their reserves. But a consequence of having the USD in your reserves is that America gets to export inflation. Right? Mm-hmm. So um, what is volatility, short-term volatility for that matter, when over the long term your purchasing power also tends to increase right so yeah for me that's uh, the long-winded uh, answer to your question yeah yeah and i think it's kind of like you know we talk about people talk about uh, volatility in a country like the us as being a problem for adoption but like mm-hmm. well, the us dollar is obviously de- is still depreciate it's losing purchasing power mm-hmm. over medium to long periods of time but like in mm-hmm. countries, most countries around the, around the world aren't the US and like their fiat currencies go down much faster. So I'd imagine it's much less of a, a sell that volatility isn't an issue in, in Africa, for example, like people would understand it easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, but yeah, so that, yeah, that, that's that's super interesting. Um, so just on just i suppose the last uh couple of questions um just around that then so like for, for match and core like so what what's the revenue model is this like an open source project or is it a business or yeah what do you think oh it's a business uh we charge a one percent on every transaction okay and that, that's still actually <laughs> that's still actually better than like you know most payment providers even in like you know western europe or america like so you're mm-hmm. you might be actually um like your whole business is kind of predicated obviously you know this but predicated around like the hyper bitcoinization happening in africa and like you guys could just end up leapfrogging our payment systems <laughs> um which would be great <laughs> That's the dream right there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, what about future plans then? So, where's uh, what? What's next for Matching Core? Where Where's it going? Oh yeah, uh, there's a lot of stuff in the works. Um, something I'm looking to deploy either today or tomorrow is an affiliate program, right? Um, and um having multilingual um what's this multilingual support on the ussd interface you know um, part of the thing i learned with the Xenumia project is that most um what's the word financial institutions do not make their apps available in other languages or their websites available in other languages some do most don't right? uh, most just keep whatever um, language was um, the medium of instruction or imposed by the colonizer. And then, you know, maybe one or two other languages. But then what's worst about this is that um, if you have a pension fund, a retirement fund and all this jazz, you are not going to read about it in any other language except English. You know, like how do you know how your pension fund works, how do you know what type of assets your retirement annuity uh, has if you cannot read that in um, a language you speak at home, right? So, um, yeah, um, most of the time in, um, around our countries, people then end up having a disdain for the banking system because they save up money for their kids' education. And when it comes time for the kid to go to school, they learn that the money that they were saving is actually less than what they had put in in the first place, because that's how poorly the investment had underperformed. Right? And yeah, so they have a disdain for the financial banking system. So 
for me, what I want is, you know, back back to why exonomia is getting rid for of the language barrier. A person should understand Bitcoin and its volatility and why it's volatile. Huh? So, yeah, and when they are using it, they should understand what they are using and not just be like, oh, number go up. Um, and they should be able to track the performance over time, right? And yeah, so um, I want to have multilingual support. And well, this is not a Machangura project, but um, an Exonumia project where we set up a toll free number a person could dial and listen to some of the translations, right? So they pick a language and then pick what they want to listen to, so on and so forth, and learn about Bitcoin, learn about economics. Um, the dream is to have the Bitcoin standard translated. And yeah, what other stuff? Uh, well, for Majangura specifically, um, I also wanted to work in a self custodial fashion because now I'm custodying the funds on behalf of uh, the user. Right? And as we all know, not your keys, not your coins. And yeah, I would like to operate the service in a fashion whereby it would work quite well even if a world war breaks out, you know? Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, I don't think that is the case for as long as it's a custodial um, service, right? Um, and yeah, um, so yeah, I call that project Project 2%. Um, and the dream for that is to basically give a person without an internet connected device the ability to send and receive Bitcoin in a self custodial fashion. And yeah, now it's promising. Uh, there's one missing element for that, which is how does that person um, send and receive blockchain data? You know, how do they broadcast their transaction to their net to the rest of the bitcoin network without an internet connection how do they see the um, unspent transaction outputs without an internet connection to query a peer for um, um a block data you know so that is the missing piece um all the other pieces are there you can literally sign a bitcoin transaction on java card which is um the platform that sim cards are on and yeah I just haven't uh, spent enough time programming the thing uh, as I should have. But yeah, um, I should be focusing on that in the next few days. And yeah, so those are the plans moving forward. That's cool. There, there might be some angle, like I don't know how well it would fare in World War, but you know, like like Blockstream satellite or something like that to, mm-hmm. to sync with the network. I'm sure you've thought of that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, most definitely. Um, the thing, though, is that um, I'm looking at things that would be easy to deploy without having to wait for them to be imported. Right? Um, well, yes, I think I can just set up a normal satellite, uh, but for the most part, I just don't know where I'd get a satellite in South Africa. You know, um, uh, I would... A cheap enough satellite, I think I would have to order from Blockstream because I think they went for the cheapest uh, in, on the market, right? And yeah, but uh, the other thing with Blockstream satellite is once you set it up, how are you going to propagate that um, data to the rest of the community, right? So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, okay, um, and then... Yeah, so like just just a separate question, maybe not related to Match and Core, because you're obviously doing a lot of like you're building your own kind of payments infrastructure for Africa. So you're like you're building something that needs to be built that isn't currently there. And with Exonumia, you have a big education product project for languages. Like, is there anything else that you think needs to be built that isn't being built at the moment that maybe you don't have time for? You just like to see done better. Mm, let me see. Uh, there's probably a lot. Sadly, nothing is coming to mind now. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. So, well, so technically, this is not the best answer to your question, right? But technically, everyone faces a challenge uh, when they first need to use Bitcoin, 
right? Um, and uh, I was asking a few of the people I work with, like, what is the um, challenge that they are facing when um, they you need to use Bitcoin? Sadly, no one knows, right? Um, oh, oh, I know, I know, I know. Okay, le- let me not give you the long answer. I, I just give you a simple one. Uh, but I'm going to work on this one too. So basically... <laughs> Explaining mining sucks. Explaining how Bitcoin mining works sucks, right? And it sucks even more when you realize that, yo, mining is such a simple thing. Why is there no app you can download from the Play Store or the App Store that literally lets you mine and shows you what the hash you mm, hashed looks like and then beneath that or somewhere on the ui suggest what the expected hash should have been right um yeah a certain number of leading zeros um would have been the expected thing right so yeah and let's say during a demonstration you actually hash and by some stroke of luck you find a block broadcast that block and actually uh, end up with uh, the reward on that person's phone right so yeah um i might set that up um i was actually thinking of making it a feature for machangura users uh they visit the website and they go to a section um where they can mine bitcoin right and in the process of mining bitcoin they learn what it's actually happening right so they have to swipe to actually hash right so yeah uh, just to give a person a picture of what is actually happening when they are mining bitcoin or when bitcoin is being mined and maybe even go as far as showing them the percentage of hash that they are contributing to the rest of the network. It might be 0.10, 0.1 um, percent, right? Uh, but yeah, just to give a person a picture of literally how many people are hashing it or how much hash is in the space versus mm-hmm. what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. It's just especially like I think mining within Bitcoin, like how mining works and nodes and all that is probably the most difficult thing to to explain to anyone um Mm -hmm. yeah and i i don't know if i've really heard anyone give a very good it's just something that kind of your understanding kind of falls into place from various and it's Mm -hmm. it's not succinct um but yeah so i suppose just to wrap up then so like um how could people help you like what what support uh do you need if if any and um where where can we find you okay oh yeah so um go to a triple dreaded movie and you'll see where to find uh, me uh, on twitter most of the time um for help yeah, i think for like if you push bitcoin adoption you you're helping me you're making my life a lot easier so um, i usually say uh, solve whatever is the most immediate need for yourself and most of the time you're solving a problem for somebody else right um, like even with the guys that um, came up with the lightning address right? um, them solving the lightning address issue for themselves actually helped me um, um, because I, yeah, um, I don't think this project would have existed without the lightning address um, the guys at Azteco selling bitcoin vouchers solved that problem of how do people get uh, bitcoin uh, without internet access for me, you know, they just buy a voucher from the store and I don't have to ever think about that again. Uh, so I think every person should just solve whatever problem they deem as a problem. Right? If you don't like um, the peer to peer market for some reason, do whatever you think would be better than a peer to peer market. If you don't like um, KYC, do whatever you think is better than KYC. And if it works, chances are I'll use it. Um, well, not just me, if, if one else in the space, right? And I think that is the other beauty of um, Bitcoin. Everyone is working together separately. Right? And yeah, so uh, let's make the most of that work. Okay, yeah, th- that's brilliant. Um so yeah and uh, yeah yeah, i see you're very active on twitter so um 
if everyone can uh, can go there to keep to speed. So okay, thanks you, thank you Kozatsu, um, and we'll have you again on the podcast in a couple of months. See how you're you're doing if if you're up for it again. Almost oh, definitely, man. Great stuff. And thank you for having me. No problem. No problem. Brilliant.